You know, the thing I think I love so much about Jesus is that Jesus didn't just stay up in heaven, but rather Jesus came to this earth. I love it because he didn't just come to give us religion. He didn't just come to give us a bunch of rules, but rather he came to this earth because he wanted to walk in relationship with you and me because he loves us so much. Jesus wants to walk with you today. Are you walking with him? You know, I think so many times we get it wrong. We think that walking with Jesus means it's going to be this easy-go-lucky life, that no problems are ever going to come our way. But we know that's not true. I mean, King David, the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. He writes, he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Did you know that you're going to walk through some valleys? You're going to walk through some hard times? But the promise of Jesus is that he will walk with you. Isn't that great? You see, it all of a sudden brings a sense of peace over you when you understand that you're not leading Jesus, but rather Jesus is leading you. All you have to do is follow him. The Bible says that the steps of a righteous man are ordered. All you have to do is follow Jesus. And the promise and the beautiful thing about Jesus is this, is that when you get tired, when you get fatigued, when you feel like you can't make it, when you feel like giving up, when you say, this road is getting too hard, Jesus looks at you and me and says, I will carry you. I don't know about you, friends, but that that gets me fired up. He will carry you. He says that his burden is light and his yoke is easy. Following Jesus isn't hard. It's putting your trust, it's putting your faith, and it's following the one who made you. Today, I challenge you. Get in relationship with Jesus. Start following him today. He has a plan for your life. The young preacher you just saw comes from a long line of ministers, and it turns out going in the same direction as your parents isn't that uncommon. Take a look. They are familiar faces in ministry, in government, in music, in Hollywood. With one thing in common, they followed in the footsteps of their families. So the question is, what kind of legacy will you leave? Well, here to help us understand the importance of legacy is Rich Wilkerson, pastor of Trinity Church in Miami, founder of Peacemakers, and father of (laughs) the young man we just saw. Rich, welcome to the program today. Thank you, Terry. Talk a little bit about your son, because he's not afraid to share Jesus with Hollywood, which could be a little intimidating these days. Did you you have something to do with leading him down that path? (laughs) Uh, I don't know. We, uh, we have four sons, and all of them are in the work of the Lord, yeah. full-on, excited. Um, yeah, I, I, we just, I think, I think, you know, Terry, we made it fun. Yeah. You know, my dad could make legalism fun. <laughs> I mean, just, I mean, I, he just, he was a happy person. And that's the way we, we see Jesus, just, mm-hmm. I mean, we want to do this, you know, so... Yeah. It, Uh, Talk a little bit about that because your family history is so unique. I mean, David Wilkerson, crossing the switchblade, big pastor in New York, was your cousin. Uh, You've got four sons, all of them in ministry. How would you define what legacy is? What does that mean to you, spiritual legacy? It's 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 assuring the fact that when you're gone, it lives on. Mm -hmm. That's it. Uh, It's not so much what I do; it's what I pass on to ensure the mission continues. That's legacy. There's a saying every father should remember that one day his son will follow his example instead of his advice. (laughs) What kind of example have you set for your sons? You talked about your dad setting the example of ministry and following Jesus being something wonderful and fun. Oh, yeah. That that was daddy. And, uh, you know, I don't think I ever heard him say, gee whiz. I mean, he just, he just, I mean, just... But he didn't put that on people. It just he just was, was all about Jesus. Yeah, just all yeah. F- you know, full on. So he lived it. Uh, he was he was true to what he preached. Um, but I remember uh, the four boys, each one of them growing up. When I was home, because I was on the road a lot. My wife is the brilliant one of the two of us. She raised them. But uh, when I was home, I would I would hug them each night and kiss them, and I would kneel by their bed and pray. And I would always tell them from when they were little, before they could speak English well, I would say, "You will preach." <laughs> I would, I would say, I have people all the time say, you know, well, but feel you know, no pressure. kids always say, you know, my dad, my mom pushed me to preach. Yeah. And then every parent I've ever talked to said, you know, one thing we never did is we never, we never pushed our kids to preach. So I figure that if you're raised in the ministry, it's like a legitimate guilt trip going in. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I decided, let me put a legitimate guilt trip on you. So I would say, you will preach the gospel. And then I would say to my boys, each one of them individually on their own way, I don't know what you'll do to get money. 
you may be a doctor, you may be a ball player. It, when they were little, firemen mm -hmm. was a big thing. You know, you might be a sure, fireman. Every little boy. But whatever you do to get money, you will use that as a post to preach the gospel. That's what we believers do. We give the good news wherever we go. Well, that's really true. In a sense, all of us, all of us. have that calling. I know your dad played such a significant role in your life. What were some of the life lessons he taught you? I know he made the gospel something positive in your life, but how did he give you this deep commitment to the things that you believe and to passing them on to your own children? Well, I said it earlier, Terry, he lived it. He was so real. You know, I remember their 25th wedding anniversary, which was 100 years ago, you know. My <laughs> wife and I were living in Sacramento. They were pastoring in Monterey, California. So we drove over there to surprise them. They did not know where to come. There was a banquet at their church that night for their 25th anniversary. So Rob and I drove over. It's about a three-hour drive to surprise them. And so we parked the car a little ways away. We came up. My dad's office was to, right to the side of the front door. My dad was in there on the banquet night. Okay, <laughs> mom's getting ready. Dad's on his knees, wow. just praying. Yeah. Like, like, like his prayer would change the world that night. Mm -hmm. And I just stood there, you know, I just, I lost it. I went, wow, yeah. he just doesn't stop. Yeah. So I think the issue of living what you say you are, you're going to make mistakes. But the other thing, when he made a mistake, he'd say, you know, son, I want to apologize. I messed up. Did yeah. you forgive me? He owned it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, wow. That's, you know, that's a huge apologies lesson. always pull the rug out from your yeah. bitterness. You can't be bitter about Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Know? One of your sons, Graham, died of spinal meningitis at six months, and then God restored him and brought him back. And he's doing things today that really doctors didn't give him any hope to even survive, much less accomplish the things that he has. And yet, it has left him with some special needs. What will Graham's legacy be? Uh, Graham's legacy will basically be that um, he was there for us mm. uh, because his story enraptured thousands of people when he was a baby, and I was on the road at the time. I mean, people literally came to our meetings to hear the story of Graham. Wow. So when, when his brothers were in Christian school and I was on the road, people helped put them through Christian school, and so it was because of Graham. Uh, I, I now have a, a, a war going on between the other three brothers as to who will take him <laughs> when Rob and I are with Jesus. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, he's, he's been the heart and soul of our family mm -hmm. because we realize that you cannot step over certain ones to lift other ones up. Yeah. And you take everyone with you on the journey. No one gets walked on to reach someone else. Yeah, and nobody gets left behind. Exactly. Yeah. For people who are listening and watching what we're talking about and sharing right now that maybe didn't have the same kind of dad you did, the same kind of support of family history and legacy, but they'd like to start that for their family. What would you say to them? Where do you begin? Well, that's the whole thing. There's always got to be a patriarch and a matriarch. Yeah. You always point back to someone. So if you haven't had that tag, you're it. You get to start, okay? You'll be the one, should Jesus tarry, that 30, 40, 50 years from now, they'll be looking back to, you know, to Grandpa, you know, Jackson. If it wasn't for him, that's what we have in our family. But the person watching now that never had that can be that person. Mm -hmm. And the way they be that person is to live the life first. Yeah. You know, St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use These words. words. Yeah. So that whole idea of living it out and being real mm -hmm. to who you say you are, yeah. that transfers to young people yeah. like crazy. And that comes from a dynamic yeah. personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You can't manufacture it, can so you? So true. Wow. So much to share. Well, we asked our friends on Facebook if they had any questions that those of you at home would like to ask Rich on leaving a godly legacy. And Sharon writes, Christian parents who raise their kids in church feel like failures if their kids don't follow the Lord when they grow up. What would you say to them? It's not about right now. Yeah. Just not a, it's just not about right now. If you've done it the way God told you to do it, train up a child and the way you should go, mm -hmm. in the end, they won't depart from it. You see, a parent's love and, and godly upbringing, that's called hooks. Mm -hmm. And those hooks are set so deep. Yeah. 
Yeah. I love to fish. And if you get a hook set deep, and I don't care how the fish will get tired if you don't yeah. tire out first. Sometimes it's hard to get the hook out when you need to. Thank right? you. <laughs> <laughs> then they come home for a yeah. long time. I like That's to a fish problem. Too. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gail asks, if I plant the seeds of truth about Jesus in the hearts of my children, but they don't seem interested, how do I know that they'll follow Christ when they're older? Can it be guaranteed? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it's a test. Yeah. It's always a test. Uh, and, and some children are just testier than others. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe they got let down somewhere that mom and dad don't know about. Mm -hmm. Not at home, somewhere out there. And so they're going to test mom and dad at every point to see, are they yeah. real? Are they going to hang in there? So just don't quit. It's that, yeah. it's that, it's the longevity of your faith, mm -hmm. you know, not the intensity of your yeah. faith, the longevity of your faith. Tenacity. That children. You have yeah. to have tenacity Absolutely. as a parent, don't you? Especially in the world today. Absolutely. I mean, my word, there's so many things pulling and tugging at, at all of us and and at our kids as well. And if we can't set the, the standard of pure truth and rock solid presence, then they True. won't find it in the world. Yeah. So we need to be... We, Tag, you're it. <laughs> That's it. Rich, thank you so much thank for being you, with us and for sharing such words of wisdom.